Well, thank you for joining today. I want to welcome uh, prospective students uh, for uh, being able to uh, take part with some of my colleagues here who are uh, alumni of Pacifica Graduate Institute. Um, they've been gracious to uh, offer their time to do this today. We're all very apologetic that we can't actually meet you in person because normally in on the introduction days, um, this panel discussion is, is what many of us consider one of the highlights because you get to speak to people who graduated from Pacifica from the different programs. And you get to, we get to have lunch together, we get to sit in different uh, meetings together and we don't get to do that today. So it's kind of a disappointment for us and I'm sure it is for you, but like, like we're all doing right now um, across the world, we're taking care of ourselves in the best way we can. And so we hope you're able to do that as well. Uh, a little about myself, my name is Tom Lyon. I graduated from the um, counseling program with an emphasis in depth psychology in 1998. Um, so I've been out there a while, I'm a licensed, um, uh, marriage and family therapist in California. Um, I've been married for it'll be coming 36 years. I have two grown daughters and an Australian shepherd at home. And uh, I was the first president of the Alumni Association and I try and give back in this way to uh, my fellow alumni and as well prospective students. So with that uh, I would like uh, each of the members to introduce themselves and let's start with Ginger. You can't she's hear me. Oh, she's not here. I'm sorry. I should have said that. We have one of our uh, the members today, Ginger Swanson, who is going to join us and uh, she's delayed for some reason. We hope she will join us. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, Olivia, Vanessa, Nicole, and Cheryl. So let's start with Olivia. All right, thank you, Tom. Um, my name is Olivia Happelblock. Um, I, I began at Pacifica in 2013 in the MYTH program, and I defended this past June. Um, my dissertation focused on myth, alchemy, and religion in a 1614 alchemical text that I actually translated from the Latin. Uh, my background is in Latin, English, and education. Um, I actually moved out to Santa Barbara for Pacifica. Um, I grew up in Chicago, um, and I went to school in Michigan for my undergrad. I did uh, Latin and English for second education, um, moved out here to, for Pacifica, and then I actually began working at uh, Dos Pueblos High School, which is in Goleta, California. It's about 20 minutes up the road. So um, I've been working at Pueblos as a Latin, English, philosophy, um, film studies, and mythology teacher uh, since 2014. Um, I am the current vice president of the Alumni Association at Pacifica. Um, and I do a lot of different conferences, uh, which have all unfortunately been canceled or moved online. Um, I do a lot with American Academy of Religions with the Western Region Conference. Um, and I was accepted into the, the inaugural um, Outlander Conference that was gonna be held at the University of Glasgow in Scotland um, this June, but it has since been canceled. So um, hopefully, Things will be back next year with different conferences and things like that. Um, I look, I work a lot with the classics, with my Latin background, um, and philosophy and then mythology. Um, I'm married. I, I just got married in January, and I have two cats who might make a guest appearance. So if they pop up, that's that's my two cats. So happy to be here. I remember my intro to Pacifica Day, um, and it definitely did help me to determine whether or not. Uh, Pacifica was the right place for me. So um, for the, all of you turning in, I hope that this gives you some clarity and guidance and um, just in, enjoy the experience. I wish you could be on Pacifica's campus. I think we can all speak to the magic of Pacifica's gardens and the floral, uh, you know, the flowers and the fields and the trees and um, 
Pacifica is truly a magical place. So I'm sorry that you can't physically be here, but I sincerely hope that you're able to make it out soon. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Olivia. And we'll get back to you in a moment. Um, so let's, uh, let's go to Sherry next. Hi, um, my name is Sherry Steinkellner. I am a Santa Barbara resident and I am a writer, a long time writer for decades. I've worked in television, in film, uh, theater, musicals, and um, animation. And I was writing a play about three and a half years ago, maybe almost four years ago, and it was kicking my butt and I didn't know how to get through it. And I thought, maybe I'll go see if there's just a little class at Pacifica that could loosen things up. And I went up to a day just like this uh, on campus and there was a one sheet of paper about the humanities, engaged humanities and the creative life program. And I turned it over and on the back were about 24 book covers, illustrations of about 24 book covers. And I had on my bookshelf about 23 of them and I had never read one of them. And I thought, okay, this is a call to action. I am signing up for this program and I'm gonna read the books on my shelf. Um, I'll get into it a little bit more later, but I remember when I began at Pacifica in this program, they told us, you have no idea what's going to happen. You can't even guess or imagine the changes that you are going to go through. I've been a writer for my entire career. And in the time that I went to Pacifica, I wrote things and have continued to write things that bore that out completely. I could never have imagined at this late stage in my career, diving as deep and being as fascinated by um, the creative process and the multifacets of what I've been doing all my life um, as I turned out to be. So it's been a gift. Um, if you wanna know a little bit about me, uh, uh, in television, I wrote and ran a television show called Cheers for many years. Um, uh, I won a couple Emmys for that, a couple more Emmys for Teacher's Pet, which was a Disney animated show. You can see it on Disney+. Plus. Um, I wrote, my husband and I wrote together on those and the um, book to Sister Act the Musical, which we got a Tony nomination for. So we've done some really good stuff, but I have never understood what I have what I've done in my life in the way that I do now, and I've never written as well as I am now. So thank you, Pacifica. Wow, thank you so much, Sherry. That was, that was wonderful. I don't see them on your, uh, on your bookshelf behind oh, you. Emmys, I'll take you on a little tour later. No, oh, here you no. just have, we have the Venus, de, um, de, Venus of Willendorf's that my daughters and I made, and okay. Hermes is up there, you know, the friends. I, I was thinking I would see, uh, on, on Olivia's desktop, we might see Cicero or Homer or somebody like that. I had to read those in Latin a hundred years ago. I should add one thing. My children are both, my children are both DP, or my two younger children are both DP graduates and were Latin scholars there with Mr. Souther. That's great. That's great. So um, let's go on. N Nicole, please, please. Uh, please share. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, I think my my history or my story is probably not very glamorous. It's probably a little bit more pragmatic. Um, I started Pacifica because I was haunted by the fact that I did not complete graduate school in the 90s. Um, yeah, I started at, at um, Calu, California Lutheran University, and I was, I was younger. I was just about to be married, and um, I just really didn't get it. And um, I dropped out and I felt very defeated and I felt, um, I just felt like something was missing. And so, uh, you know, after I raised my, my two daughters and they got out of what kind of that little kid age, um, I, I chose Pacifica basically because it was close to home and it did not require the GREs. And I know that that's not a very sexy thing to say, but um, I'll, I'll make it sexier at the end. Um, so when I started Pacifica, I was a typical naysayer. I am not a very woo-woo person. I, I fancy myself more of an urban hippie. And um, I questioned a lot about what I was learning and how to really apply it to making a living, um, advancing my career, and 
in the, in the course of all of that, everything changed. Like there, the, one of the questions that we've been asked to talk about a little bit is in what ways did Pacifica change you? And it's in every way, in every single way. So, um, I worked at the local psych hospital when, during, during grad school, I worked full time and it burned down when I was working there. So there was that um, hero's journey that I had to endure. And then um, currently I just, oh, I was just licensed. I just got licensed hey. a week ago Congratulations. <laughs> prior to them shutting down the, um, the uh, testing site. So I graduated um, in March of uh, 2018, I believe. And then, you know, they sat on my hours for six months. So be ready for that. And then um, pass the test. So uh, I work full time as an adolescent um, psychotherapist in the residential treatment setting in Ojai. Um, and I love it. My, the modality of treatment that I utilize is DBT, which is an evidence-based um, treatment modality, which actually fits very nicely with depth. I know that when I was in the program, we talked a lot about, about sort of CBT and depth and all of those different modalities and how they will work in the real world. And um, I'm able to utilize um, some of the, uh, the Jungian approach. I use a lot of imaginal work. Um, thank you, Kathy Miller. And um, I went very, very deep. I go very, very deep and in getting into the, the back door of sort of the adolescent psyche, because when you're working with kids that are a little bit oppositional and um, highly suicidal, it can be a little dicey. Um, I, I love the population and I'm also doing private practice. So I have a private practice of, um, of 16 clients. And um, so I'm, I'm doing two full-time gigs and I really, really like it. I'm making a lucrative income, but more importantly, I think that I have really discovered um, a deeper calling to, um, to be able to connect with a population that is incredibly acute. And um, my thesis was on school refusal. I'll just say this one last thing. My thesis was on school refusal because um, I had open heart surgery in 2012. And after that, my daughter um, had separation anxiety and has refused to go to school. So as we do with our theses and our, our uh, dissertations, we sort of gravitate toward the things that feed our soul. And um, so that has also helped me in my career quite a bit. So welcome. I don't really remember my first orientation day, but that's because I'm an old donkey now and I'm very busy and I <laughs> barely remember what I had for breakfast. But um, I do remember my cohort and my professors and the beautiful um, environment of Pacifica and it's, it's home. And I also worked for Diane as um, during work study um, at the, uh, the Alumni Association. Right so I had a very rich experience. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and I hope uh, each of you also uh, add a little bit about your cohort experience, because I think that's a unique, the really one of the unique, fabulous features of, of being at Pacifica. Thank you again. Um, Vanessa. Hi, and I'll just say welcome for everybody when they eventually get here. And thank you, um, Tom, for uh, moderating. Um, I am actually, I started Pacifica in 2016, um, and I am in the dissertation phase. I'm in the depth psychology uh, somatics program and very much enjoying it. Uh, I kind of, I think I kind of accidentally got dropped on the doorstep of Pacifica. And then uh, from there, it was like already written almost. Um, I was in homeopathic school about, oh, I don't know, when I was, I'm 48 now. So when I was about 40 years old, I told my then spouse and son, like, when I turn 45, I'm going on a spiritual quest and I, my son will get, be in college. I told my partner, I don't know what will happen with you, um, but I got to go. And well, I ended up divorced and my son went to college and my father died and I just went for it. I've, I've been a body worker now for almost 30 years and I enrolled in homeopathic school and the day that I graduated from homeopathic school, I stopped by Pacifica on the way home just to see if there was something there for me and I got locked in the bookstore <laughs> and I was 
<laughs> entirely minding my own business, reading a book in the corner. And the guy running the bookstore um, didn't notice me and, and went to lunch and locked the door. And so then soon someone walked by the bookstore and knocked on the door and was like, what are you doing in there? And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in here. I like, I don't know what I'm doing in here. I was just reading this book. And so she kind of was accusatory originally, but then she realized I had no idea. And uh, so she, after, you know, 30 minutes, I think they found whoever was running the bookstore and um, got the key and got me out. And of course, we're super apologetic and it was fine. And, and she asked what I was doing there. And I said, well, I just came to see if, you know, something is here for me. And she said, well, you're not part of the Day at Pacifica program thing that's going on. And I said, no, I don't even know about that. And she goes, oh, my goodness. She goes, if you came and we locked you in the bookstore, you have absolutely have to attend. <laughs> so um, I, I agreed. I went home and, um, and uh, applied that night. And it's kind of interesting. I thought when I originally went to homeopathic school that that would be my next sort of career. And then I didn't even hesitate. My last year of homeopathic school, when I was kind of thinking about grad school, I realized I wasn't done. I had some units still in undergrad. And that if I wanted to go to graduate school, I needed to get those done. So I end up, ended up taking 48 units in undergrad, the final year of my homeopathic school, which is at 13 units is full time. So you can imagine I was busting my rear end to do this. And I think... Since that point, I've just had monomaniacal focus with uh, my program and be, and being at, at Pacifica. It's like, it just feels like it's my time to do this. And I'm just, you know, every day so grateful that Pacifica is there in the flesh because it has really been a home away from home for me uh, with all of the transitions that I've had in the last few years. So. I'm grateful for Pacifica and for my cohort and my professors and for this great opportunity in midlife uh, to learn so much about myself and, and what I want to do next. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, the four of you. So um, you've answered uh, quite a few of the questions that I was going to ask it that we had discussed before. So I'm going to work around them a little bit. So I thought, um, I thought one thing that I heard is, um, is the personal, how the program met you as a person and, um, and what you were looking for. So in other words, like in some programs, for instance, your, your thesis paper or something, you, they assign you what you're going to write about. But you know that's not the Pacifica experience. So, so talk about how you came to get to the point where, um, you know, the study that you did following the program, but you personalized it for yourself. Does that make sense? You know, you've, you your thesis paper or whatever you did uh, came to you somehow. How did that happen throughout your, your training? Um, the professors that you had, uh, how did they um, help you find that place? And how did you find that part of the experience? Anyone can jump in here. Um, well, I can go ahead and start. Um, I, when I came to Pacifica, I actually uh, thought I had my whole dissertation planned out. I was going to compare the modernist poetry movement of the early 20th century with the um, first century BCE poets, the uh, Catullus and, and things like that, and the idea of making new poetry and things like that. And I was set, this is what I'm going to do. I know this, this is, yeah, 100%. Gives me the classics, give me gives me modernist literature, um, which were kind of my two passions at the time. Um, and I was like, for sure, this is absolutely what I'm going to do. Um, and then I got into the classes and I kind of started to shift a little bit. And um, my second year in the program, I was in the alchemy course. So it's alchemy and hermetic traditions. And that was with um, Evans Lansing Smith or Lance, mm -hmm. as we call him. Um, 
who's the head of the MYTH program. Um, Lance has traveled with Joseph Campbell. He's written a, a ton of books. Um, and we were talking about an alchemist. We were talking about Michael Mayer, um, the author of the Atalanta Fugians, um, which was a series of emblems with epigrams and a little discourse um, containing alchemical knowledge. And Lance mentioned that Mayer had another book called The Arcana Arcanissima, The Most Secret Secrets, that had yet to be translated from the Latin. And in his walking back and forth across the stage, he stopped in front of me and said, you know, Olivia, you could translate this if you wanted to. And I kind of went, huh? Okay. So I pulled out my iPad and found it easily enough online and started looking at it and was like, yeah, maybe. So I translated just a, like three pages for my paper for that class. And I really liked it. It was a really fun little investigation into this man and his life and this little bit of writing he did and why would he write about it this way and, and what sort of perspective does alchemy lend to mythology and religion and things like that. Um, so from then I was kind of hooked um, and I started thinking about it and I did in our dissertation formulation class kind of like set aside like three different ideas um, just like I would do with my students like what are three possibilities for approaching this and I thought about the modernist and classics and I thought about um, something else with mythology and, and classical mythology and things like that and then the the alchemy aspect and it was very clear to me that it was the alchemy um, the alchemical text that I wanted to get into I wanted to investigate it I wanted to learn more about this this most secret secrets what what is involved in this um, and Lance was very enthusiastic about it about being my chair um, and as I got into it I realized it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Translating uh, 1614 text was was not easy, um, but I had some great help from Dr. Jocelyn Godwin, um, who's another prolific author. He's a professor, uh, professor emeritus at Colgate University. He served as my external chair. Um, and I began to kind of shift the focus from so being, being so focused on translation into more understanding what was being said and what it meant and the the thing that I, became really important for me was the relevance why is this text relevant does it have relevance for our, our world our lives and things like that and i i found that it does i, I think there's a lot of things that i connected with um i grew up pretty um strict evangelical um didn't, and I had, I knew a lot about religion. I knew a lot about different aspects of Christianity and church history and things like that. Um, so it was nice to be able to use that. And in fact, my author was Lutheran and I ended up going to a Lutheran um, middle school. So I kind of had that background, um, but he worked for a whole bunch of Calvinists and I actually went to Calvin College for college. Um, so it was funny just how all the aspects of my life and things that I had learned actually really came into play in my analysis and my research. And it was almost like it was meant to be. Mm -hmm. um, and through the process, just getting to know who was this guy, this guy who lived and worked, he wrote prolifically. What was his deal? What was at the core of who he was? And I think there was some searching there that I did of, well, who am I? Who am I to be writing about him? Who am I to say these things? Um, and I had a, my, the best compliment I received from my external reader um, was that I really got the soul of who this man was. And I think that idea of soul searching is such a key aspect to Pacifica, of, you know, the soul of the world, but also our own souls. Um, and so not only did I learn so much about this man and his journey and, and things like that, but about my own journey, you know, and, and knowing that I'm still on the path and still discovering things and trying to figure out where we go, where does the path lead from here? Um, so it was, it was a very interesting experience that really showed kind of those, we, we could call them synchronicities, we could call them happy accidents, you know, that all led to my Pacifica experience. I think, thank you so much for that. I think what I hear through you and, and I've heard from each of you is again, this personal, but also how you, 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 you tend soul in yourself, but you tend soul in the world. So who, who else would like to, uh, to share that with, with us? 
Sherry. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, my first quarter, I joined in the spring, and um, which is a little bit unusual. And I, my first classes were not foundational classes. So I was thrown into the deep end. I didn't know the language. It was a whole new world, but, um, but it was pretty great. And I had a, one of my wonderful teachers, Dr. Jennifer Selig, um, was teaching a course at the time uh, where we were studying um, influences on how generations of creators influence other generations. Um, and looking at the whole. And I became obsessed in that first quarter with a particular author, I won't mention who, um, but with her, uh, um, with her writing about her daughter. She was a woman a little older than me and um, has an had an estranged relationship with her daughter who was also a writer. And they had both written extensively about their estrangement in their blogs and their and their other writing and their poetry and so forth. And um, in the course of this first course, I just could not get enough of trying to sleuth out the story of these two women who were alive, writing about, talking about each other, but not to each other. And so for my final project in that class, I fashioned a play, as I do, but I used all of their words, all the things that they said about each other, I took from being third person and put them into first person and put the two of them into conversation. It was a kind of, I'm gonna fix them because I can't fix me and my mom because my mom died 17 years ago and I couldn't have those conversations that we never got to have. Well, that was the key part that I didn't realize. I didn't know that in me trying to put these other two women together, I was actually doing my own work. And that's what my instructor pointed out to me and set me on a path of really studying the parent-child and specifically the mother-daughter relationship uh, as a daughter and as a mother of daughters. Um, I became just... Um, immersed. Um, the left turn that it took in my life was the next thing that I began to write. And I began to write it the night here in Santa Barbara, January 9th, I think 8th, 9th um, 2018, when all of the mountain came down after the fires during the flood and the mud mudslides. Um, I woke up in between the fire and the mudslides and began writing about and in time with my mother, um, imaginally, um, through archetype and active imagination and alchemical processes as they were, all of my studies fed into my final thesis project, which was a play that I wrote called Prima Materia, um, and uh, in which I finally got to have the last conversation with my mom that I never got to have in life. Um, I didn't think, I thought it was just something I was doing for myself. I thought it was just a play that I was, and, and for, my, for my education to complete my, my work here. Um, just recently now, um, two years later, uh, after beginning writing that play, um, we did a, a reading of it. I did a reading of it at my first Jungian conference. I did a, sm a short reading of it. And I did it again recently and realized so many people came and so many people, the way they um, identified and spoke with me about it afterwards, it made me realize, oh, I'm gonna have to put this in the world now because this thing that I thought I did for myself is, um, I just kind of got lucky to pull in and become a, a conduit a, um, you know, a, a, a messenger like that guy, um, for, uh, for this idea that, um, beyond the stories we tell our, ourselves in this ego and in this life, there are bigger stories. Um, that's all, that might be a little esoteric here at Day in Pacifica, Day at Pacifica, but, um, but I hope it speaks on, on some kind of level because it was pretty cool. And now my mom and I are all made up and we have so much fun together. Yeah, so this is the transformative, yeah. yeah.
That's beautiful. Well, um, I'm going to, I'm going to just take a moment here because we had our, we have our, our other panelists that just joined and hopefully she can hear me. And uh, this is uh, Ginger Swanson. And we were so happy you could join us today. And um, I guess uh, if you can, uh, in just a moment, uh, if you can just uh, say um, about two and a half minutes about yourself and how you got to Pacifica, how 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 it found you, and uh, and then and then we'll hopefully you'll catch up with us wherever we're at. And by the way, I'm Tom, and uh, I think you have the names of the others, but you'll figure that out as we go along here. Hi, go Tom. Ahead, Hi, Tom. Um, sorry, I've been on freeze mode trying to get in. Um, and I have an echo back right now. But can you ask me whatever question you'd like to ask? Sure, sure. Well, um, I'd, we'd like to know a little bit about your background, uh, which program you were in uh, when you graduated, what you're doing with that now, how you found your experience. We're going to get into like, what was it like being the cohort? Uh, the last question we talked about, if if you, even I can remember, because uh, everyone's been just engaging so far. Again, we're, we're, we're doing this, we can't do this obviously live as we really wanted to with, with uh, prospective students, uh, but we're trying to give them um, who will be listening to this an idea of who we are, uh, what our experiences was, how we have uh, continued in our life, making it personal, tending soul in the world in our own way. Thank you, and my apologies for, for joining in late. I am Ginger Swanson. I started Pacifica in 2008, and it was after having attended Steve Eisenstadt's Dream Tending and a political weekend on politics and depth psychology. I don't recall the name of the workshop, but it was fascinating and riveting, and it hooked me, both of those events, particularly the dream tending, however. And uh, I did not have any idea what depth psychology was at that time. And uh, I became excited and I dove in and left a career, a three decade career of crunching numbers and being a financial controller in law firms and corporate world work um, and entered into the world of psychology. And since then, uh, I graduated with my PhD in 2000 and December of 14, I defended 2015 conferred and have started a retreat, a serum retreats in Santa Barbara, California. And I run body, mind and soul retreats and memoir writing retreats. I also have a private practice, a small private practice and an office in downtown Santa Barbara where I work with clients. I do hypnotherapy sessions privately. And when I do retreats, I often kick off my retreats with hypnotherapy sessions. And we dive into, over and over and over again, we dive so quickly into the, the um, realm of depth psychology, particularly when working with memoir writing um, clients in my memoir retreats. Uh, also, I've done legacy retreats. So I've taken the Pacifica experience into a couple of different aspects of my life. Fortunately, I've been able to say goodbye to the financial controller positions I used to hold and, uh, and am uh, wearing a couple of different hats, enjoying the depth psychology world and also teaching part time in the DPT program. So I'm very happy. Uh, I love uh, that I did this. It in many ways felt like a self indulgence. And in other ways, it felt like it was absolutely necessary for my soul to make a change in life when I made it. And I am so grateful that Pacifica was there and I was able to do that. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, the, the problem with this, this time period is that it's time limited. And uh, because I, boy, I'd love to, 
I'd love to spend the afternoon talking with all of you, and perhaps you would like to as well, but we can't do that. Um, so we're gonna, so I'm gonna, I think I'll, I'll go to Vanessa next, uh, if she'd like to join in about anything that we've talked about so far. Uh, I, I really, I was really enthused about the, your work with adolescents, um, which I've, I've done in, in my practice, but uh, something touched you personally that has, has moved you in different ways, so. Are you referring to me? <laughs> Yes, I am I'm sorry, Nicole. <laughs> Nicole, I have the wrong. Yeah, I'm the I'm adolescent sorry. Sherpa in the group. You're um, the adolescent Sherpa. Yes. Um, well, so the question was, how did I? I think I think during you know during the cohort process, all of us were so different. I was I was the last L. We were the the final L track, and um, all of us were so different, and. Um, Early on, um, I, there was quite a bit of dissonance about people that wanted to work solely with uh, couples, and um, some people, you know, didn't didn't like the the idea of diagnosing. I myself have learned that I'm, pardon my French, but I'm kind of a diagnosis bitch. Like I like to know what I'm working with, especially when I'm working with adolescents. Um, I find it very helpful. Um, but I, I gravitate to that population and, um, I don't know if, whether it's because I have two adolescent daughters of my own that I'm pretty close with, but I really, really feel that, um, they, that, uh, their perception really, really fits very well with, um, with everything that I learned at Pacifica from top to bottom. And, um, I think that kids they really enjoy the imaginal work. They enjoy, um, they enjoy finding sort of the impetus for their behaviors rather than being lectured. So it works really nicely when I'm, when I'm sort of um, incorporating DBT and depth together, which seem very counterintuitive, but they're actually not. Say what um, DBT is for, for prospective students who, who don't know what that is. Yes, dialectic behavioral therapy. <laughs> and it is evidence-based and a lot of programs, especially working with adolescents and borderline individuals. Um, it's, it's the modality of choice right now for funding. But um, it's one thing that the whole point is to, is the, the bottom line goal for, for DBT is um, developing a life worth living. And that fits so well with, with sort of the things that we learned at Pacifica or that I learned at Pacifica, because when you figure out what that means, and, and I remember my admissions counselor, um, I don't know if she's still there or not, but Allison, oh, um, I said, I don't know what I want to do with this degree. I don't know. I just know that I need to do something. And she said, it doesn't matter what you want to do. It matters how you want to feel. And um, I, I, I really, res that resonated with me and I use that with my clients even now. And I say, you know, it doesn't matter. It's not about me lecturing them. They tell me, you know, I wanna do drugs or I wanna, I wanna cut. And I'm like, okay, sell me. What, is, what mm. is your soul? What is your soul hungry for? And um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to have that conversation with their parents. I'll tell them why it's relevant. <laughs> but um, also I wait until they're in balance. When you're in balance, I'll advocate for whatever you need. And um, so I think that C.D. Taylor, he was a guy that taught us um, an, um, an addiction specialist. Mm. And he did a lot of uh, um, imaginal work. And I, I use that quite a bit with my adolescent clients. Wow. So. Great. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, branch off of something you said that how important it is uh, to meet with the, uh, uh, with the admissions person, the account, I mean, you'll have to do that anyway, if you're going to do it, but they're really helpful at, at, uh, at aligning um, prospective students because it, it, it's confusing. And actually, I, I've seen where some people on introduction day, they thought they wanted one program. And after they heard some of the others, they said, no, this other program was the right one for me. And um, so, and, and that's what this is about. It's to find find what really fits fits with you and it's going to take your life forward and i i think you've shared that wonderfully i'm going to i'm going to jump to you now vanessa 
Are you ready? You know, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I, as a body worker, I gravitated towards the some. Well, we program, lost you there for a second. And it just seemed, can you still hear me? Uh, yes, it's just a little time me? lag there. Okay. Um, I gravitated towards the somatics program. Uh, I know the somatics program now is um, undergoing some changes. They're going to um, reconfigure some things. So if someone's interested in that, I would, I would want them to know to express their interest in a somatics oriented type program at, at the very least. And um, maybe just hang on a second because there's some things changing there. Um, and so anyway, I, uh, it, the somatics program is a non-licensed program. And, um, I think about midway through, I thought, uh, oh, am I in the right program? And even to this day, I have the conversation sometimes with my chair, like, am I doing the thing that's going to allow me to be my fullest self in the world? And I think what I have learned is to harken back a moment to your question about how you came to your dissertation or your thesis or that work. My work is uh, emerged easily within the program. My field work came up easily. My, um, my dissertation topic came up through that work. And it's through that work that I'm actually still learning how relevant the non-licensed program is. It's very novel. Like there are not a lot of non-licensed PhD somatic programs. And so we, in a way, are pioneering a, a path. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm an adventurous person, so I like that. But I also want to be able to be in my full expression uh, and not limited by license or inhibited because I don't have the right licensure. So um, what I am finding is that the path is unfolding before me and I am literally just taking the next step and I'm really comfortable with that. So I think that happens a lot at Pacifica. I think through learning about yourself, you one door opens and you can't see the next door till you step through that threshold and that's okay. And I think you get really comfortable with discomfort and that's really cool because that to me is where expansion happens. Uh, so that has been my experience at Pacifica. I think sometimes you go in with an instinct to, to uh, a certain program, and I say trust that instinct 100% because something's calling you to maybe vocation or exploration, and there's value in that. Great. Thank you. Um, one, a couple of the questions I want to kind of tie them together. Um, as with any program and with any choice in life, there are, there are costs involved and there are benefits, and the costs can be all kinds of things. And I'm not talking just about the cost of the program, the, the cost of books, the cost of travel, staying, but also how you have to balance the rest of your life with, with family, with friends, with um, cohorts, all, all in your own your own time with yourself um, I, I was I was full-time working while I was in the program and uh, and it was a, it was a balancing act um, but but if it if it means that much to you, you can do things but besides yourself there are other people that sacrifice as well so um, I'd like you to each of you kind of talk about that aspect of it Go ahead, Ginger. Yes, so I had a struggle with making a decision between, first of all, the depth and the humanity programs. And I realized that with the depth program, you could keep on going beyond a master's to the PhD level. So that was kind of the breaking point for me. And I was working as a contract controller, a financial controller from a distance for a law firm. And when I started, I thought, oh, how beautiful, I can pay as I go. Well, less than six months into my Pacifica term, the law firm reconstructed and 
they went from contract to in-house and consolidated and then the law firm since broke up but it was a 30 year old client that i'd had for many years so i i thought it was a sure bet so i became um as vanessa mentioned earlier i think you know we're we're um you know we have to become comfortable with uncertainty and one of my phrases was being sure-footed in the flux because i went from thinking i could fund this to oh shoot i have to go the uncle sam route and get the student loans and i have had some angst over that and it has been uh, a process that has not been easy all the time um, the saving grace for me in that process is knowing how much richer I am for the journey. And now reconfiguring, you know, how can I best handle that as I go on? So 2015 to 17, those first couple of years after graduation, when getting my toddler legs, you know, starting to learn how to get training wheels on the bike with my new degree, those first couple of years were a little bit uh, nerve wracking for me with regard to the student loan scene. And then I made friends with the whole deal and learned how to manage everything with this is just part of part and parcel of the program and it isn't a great big looming thing like it felt originally. So it was about, you know, coming to a reckoning with how to manage it. And I feel very comfortable now, whereas I can honestly say I wasn't always. And again, I know what this journey did for me on a soul level and it's worth it any day of the week mm. would i have liked to have had that financial controller job and financed it you bet but the other side of that stone is i wouldn't have been able to dive so deeply into my work which i was able to do by being able to be a student loan uh, beneficiary or recipient if you will very nice very yeah. nice yeah wow Anyone else yeah. like to join in? Yeah, so I also thought that I had uh, funding for it just from uh, family sources and things like that. And I had actually moved out to Santa Barbara um, and I quickly realized that Santa Barbara costs a lot more to live in than Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, so I too had first year was okay, but then second year had to switch to the student loans, um, which the, company and financing and things like that have been actually pretty decent to work with. So, um, you know, in terms of financial costs, like it is, it is significant. Um, and I also have worked full time through the program, teaching up to seven different preps, that's seven different classes a day, um, and preparing those classes, materials, curriculum. So um, without that full time job, you know, I couldn't, I could not have afforded to take on student loan debt right now. Um, and I will say like the physical and the, just the like mental, like exhaustion is, is real. Um, I actually back in June when I defended, we got home from the defense at like three in the afternoon and I laid down on the couch and I fell asleep for four hours, just all of the energy and all of that emotional toil, just, you know, leaking out. So, um, you know, I had to get really good about using Saturdays and Sundays at the Pacifica library, um, about coming home and saying, okay, I'm doing an hour of work tonight, or I'm doing two hours of work tonight, um, and setting small specific goals. I'm getting through this book today and, or I'm getting four pages written today. And those are very specific goal setting things. Um, really helped me to get through it. And um, I was very blessed to have met my, my husband um, actually in the process. And he has always been very supportive of me and my schoolwork and um, just having that support and then familial support as well has just been really great. Um, so I've had a lot of help and a lot of support in that way. And, and also the cohort. Um, we had about 30 people when we started, about 23 to 25 when we ended. Um, and about 10 of them have now defended and are, have earned their PhD. So um, that was another great support throughout the process of, of having a Facebook group so we could post things and we had our own hashtag of getting it done, getting the papers done, getting the dissertation done, getting the presentations done, um, being able just to chat with people who were going through it, the same thing um, was just really comforting to have them there. Um, and have, I've made several amazing friendships that 
um, will definitely last me the rest of my life because they've just been, they went through it. They went through the journey. We all went through it together and we have that support with one another. So, um, and I, I don't know that you have that in a traditional grad school program. I don't know that you have that sort of you, the cohort and the relationship building um, that you get through going through a program at Pacifica. I don't know that you have that at other schools. So it, it definitely helped. So would, um, I mean, I could do it, but I was wondering if you could explain what the cohort experience is. In other words, you're there for a few days, uh, once a month, and then a week during the summer, that type of thing. Sure. I can yeah. tell you what it was 20 years ago, but. <laughs> so in the cohort system, um, you start with a group of folks. Um, we were I track. I think that Nicole mentioned being in the last L track. So each program has their own thing. And that's if you meet at your meeting on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or the weekdays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I know some of the other programs do like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or things like that. So um, for myth, we met, it was for three days. So you had class one on Friday, class two on Saturday, class three on Sunday. Um, and we were with the same group of people. Um, and so you go through the, the whole program with them. Um, sometimes people would take a leave off. So like um, the first day of our, our group, one of our cohort members found out she was pregnant. So she ended up taking off uh, the spring uh, semester. Um, other people would come back to do a year or a, a semester. Um, some people only did the masters, and if you only do the masters, you only do the first two years of classes. So they left, and then other people came in. Um, but at the, we had probably about 15 to 20 people that were, we started together. Um, and you are put on teams to do presentations, or um, you're working on doing discussions, or you might focus more on one book, another group focus on the other book. So. Um, the Pacifica has set it up that you're not you're not going through the journey alone, right? You've got your your cohort, your group. Um, we were termed the motley throng. That was our our cohort's nickname amongst the role of the professors, and we kind of took that on ourselves. So, right. Who else would like to join in on this? Go ahead, Sherry. Okay, so I'll jump in for the humanities program, which is different, a different kind of cohort. It's more like a Montessori, where you've got various different incoming and outgoing people over time, because it's a hybrid program. Um, it's one of the two hybrid programs, which is to say, for most of the quarter, and it goes four quarters each year, you are working online. And um, you'll have weekly lectures and reading and assignments and viewings and, and, and prompts and discussions and all that stuff. But, um, but you're doing it independently and on your own time. And then we come in for two days per class or a four day weekend, generally, to the campus to meet together once per quarter. So for people who are like I was, you know, just like, couldn't take time each month to come to campus, you're able to do it on your own time. Um, I will say with this particular program too, the really nice thing for me was that um, I was able to follow in the footsteps of one of my cohort, one of the people that I started with, and go on a slower track. So I could take just one course each quarter. And it allowed me a couple of things. First of all, I could get the work all done. And I could get the work done really well rather than slamming through it and, and skimming. So I very much valued that flexibility in my program to, um, to be able to sort of, you know, do your education your way on your time. Wow. Great. So, so the different programs have different requirements. And so, um, and I, uh, so if you're on that, like you can do a weekend program or you can do a weekday program in some of them. And, and then as Sherry just said, there are um, different programs have, have other scenarios uh, to get the work done. So the school is pretty accommodating. They try and figure out what will work for you in your life. So I, I think that's important for you to know. I was just looking at my watch and we, were, we started really about, um, um, oh, Anyway, we have about 10 more minutes, I think. Um, so um, I wonder if each of you could, could, could 
sum up for yourself if if you were a prospective student um, what they need to hear what a prospective student needs to hear from you um, as as your your parting parting words of wisdom and everything you've said so far has been great so uh, maybe that's enough so you, you certainly don't have have to do this but um, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, so, but um, um, anyway, uh, anyone can jump in here. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, I would say, um, I heard this a bit of advice initially, and uh, which was don't do your inner work while you're here. That is the worst advice. Do your inner work while you're here. That's the whole point. I was talking to Donald Cowshed because I'm in a, trauma studies program with him and I told him about that advice he said who would recommend that I said I don't know I think it's the worst advice because you're building depth and breadth all at the same time it's a transformational process you will not be the same person as when you entered and 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 it's good it's a good thing um you will know so much more about yourself the level of self-awareness that you achieve through the program can take you anywhere it just really can. Um, it will open your eyes and vision and path to places you can't even imagine now. Um, and I would say lean into your cohort, lean into your professors. They're there, they're so there for you. Make time to meet with them, though they're available. Make time to spend in the research library talking them, to them about how to start collecting um, sources and citations and early on do it like right out of the gate because you when you get to your thesis or your dissertation you're going to wish you had um develop support outside of the community for other people uh with other people who are doing the same thing because it can be a little isolating because you're just changing so much inside and that you other people become less relatable in some ways because you're really in an alchemical process um, so you need support from people who understand that process. Uh, and be prepared, it, it, we, as one who's left now the residency program, is my first year um, solo again. We have a Marco Polo group and we mar Marco Polo each other a lot as a means of connecting because it's isolating. It's isolating to go from the residency into a dissertation or a thesis uh, when you're used to, you know, being with your group once a month. You can count on that retreat, that beautiful campus up there. So I think just being really open and receptive to the change, but also preparing uh, for what your long-term goal is, which is thesis or dissertation. And, and the citations and things like academically that you need along the way is good advice. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, um, uh, who else would, uh, Olivia? Oh, yeah, um, go ahead. Thanks, I'll just say really briefly that one of the things that I wish I would have been supported more on during the process is um, my need to be an individual. I did not feel, I felt like sort of like the odd duck at times because like I said, I was not a person that came into the program. Um, you know, uh, I think Ginger said, you know, she, she had no, no real understanding of what depth psychology was. I myself didn't either. I was not a person that read Jung and like, I didn't study the, I was a, you know, recovering Catholic. I didn't, I wasn't a very um, well-versed individual. Um, I knew I was smart and I knew that I was called to the program and, um, and I knew that I wanted to ease, I wanted to, per, to um, um, develop professionally. I wanted to be independent and I wanted to help my family financially. And I think that those pragmatic things at times got in the way of me feeling like I really fit in. I connected really well with my professors. I connected really well with, with um, the administration and with, with my cohort. That wasn't the problem. I just felt that, um, you know, Pacifica has uh, this sort of ethos of being this very 
um, you know, enlightened and ethereal kind of out there groovy place. And um, I really want, I kept uh, challenging my professors consistently, like, how am I, how am I going to live? How, how is this going to pay the bills? And, um, and it, it actually does pay the bills. Um, and I think also one other thing that I, that I think that I, I couldn't have really understood while I was in the program was that a lot of things that I was learning felt pretty obscure. And now that I'm practicing as a clinician, um, I understand the, the method, um, but it, I wish that I would have been able to sort of trust the process a little more because I had a lot of anxiety about, I'm not really getting it. I don't know how to put this into praxis. And um, so that's what I would say. I would just say that, that, that if you have a desire to come to school and you have a desire to come to Pacifica, um, what, whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever your reasons, it, it can work for you. You don't have to fit a certain type of right. mold. Right. That's, that's great wisdom right there because it is, it, we're all unique. And so I really appreciate that was very, uh, that was a very important needed to be said. Um, let's go, who, 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 who else had jumped in there? Was it? Yeah. So um, I would say that I would really think about what do you want to do with this? So um, one thing that I had asked actually in my interview um, was, oh, what teaching opportunities do you have? And they were like, nothing. There's no teaching opportunities. Um, so I know there are clinical opportunities and things like that within the psych programs, but in terms of being more traditionally in the academia and things like that, um, which is kind of what I, what I am interested in, um, there were no opportunities there. So if that's something that you want to do, if you're thinking, I want to go be a professor, then you need to really think about that or search for outside opportunities. So that's what I've been doing with teaching at the high school and teaching AP and IV level classes and things like that. Um, and then it's a commitment. That's the thing. And it is a really big commitment um, financially in terms of your time, both like the time that you spend within the different classes and coming to campus or spending online or writing papers, but it takes, it takes a long time. I mean, it took me um, six and a half years to get everything done. And that's a, that's a big time commitment to spend, um, which is atypical for grad schools. Direct grad school takes a long time. Um, so it's just something that you have to, to think about, about if that's really what you want to do. And if you do, then go for it. Follow your bliss. Follow what your that thread of thought of, you know, wanting to go into these different um, programs, into humanities or into um, into myth, at least for my program, or into psychology, um, and follow that. If that is really what you want to do, go for it, 100%. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let Let's Ginger. Let's okay. let's sure. see your hand. Yes. So. I would like to say that depth psychology is such a valuable contribution to the field of psychology. And what we do in depth psychology is so important because we really see shadow. Not only do we see shadow, we acknowledge and we accept and sometimes even embrace shadow. Right now we have a time in humanity where a lot of people are not feeling stable. We've got a pandemic that's out of control. And as depth psychologists, we can help people to get beneath what's going on in the surface of this tragedy that we're facing. And I think that depth psychology offers um, a, a different paradigm, a different way, a richer, deeper way of seeing, of feeling, of finding our way through the forest. Uh, so from my perspective, depth psychology has been a savior, understanding, and understanding in ways that reduce or diminish conflict, ways that help us to shed our preconceived notions and embrace other ways of seeing and being in the world. Uh, I wasn't here earlier, but part of my field work, my field work at the master's level, I worked with women suffering from um, the pain of having had their daughters murdered. That was my material. My 
my biggest work out of that was helping people, helping women to cope with their loss and finding that. I would like to say that Pacifica emboldened and enabled me to go so deep into the darkness of that and all that that entailed. Um, and it was my cohort members that held that nest, that space for me. Some of them will be my friends till the day I die. I would encourage prospective students to do some internal reflection and to not be afraid to jump. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, Sherry. Well, adding on to what Ginger <sighs> just said, sorry, dogs. Um, I think that if I had known going in that there was going to be such stirring and such so much unexpected um, discovery, joyful and dark and and transcendent. Um, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have known what to expect, but I would have expected that there would be the kind of life shifts that um, I saw occurring for myself and for everybody that I began with and people that came through the program um, as I was going through it and or that began the program as was, I was going through it. I saw so many ginormous life changes and they had to happen, um, but I would just, I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't warned so, or, or prepared. So that's what I would offer. Okay. Well, I, I saw this quote on, um, of course, of all things, Facebook, but it was, it was from Joseph Campbell. And I thought, well, maybe this is, he was asking a question and he said, people say that when we're all, what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think what we're seeking is an experience of being alive so that our life experiences on the purely physical plane will have resonance within our own innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. And I have to say for myself that I, I have felt that from each of you today, the, the rapture of, of, uh, of coming alive and uh, more in your life, uh, partly through this program, partly through obviously the, the professors, but um, but also in your cohort. And uh, so I, I really want to thank you for being here today, for sh for sharing yourselves with uh, prospective students. Um, um, I remember when I was making a life choice of which direction I was going to go. My my counselor. Uh, he said to me, well, he said, you have to go. You can't not go. And he said, because if you don't follow what, what you think you should be doing, you're always going to be back thinking. And then whatever you do, you won't be 100% in that. So where do you want to be 100% in your life? And you have to try those things. And, um, and Pacifica might be one of those places. It, it may not. But I think... I think um, from from our perspective, for us, it was a very important experience, and um, and I, I think uh, I can say to everyone of the prospective students that uh, each each of the these wonderful women who have shared today um, are in the world, are a presence in the world, and um, so how do you want to be in the world? this might be a place where you, you can do that. So I'm, I'm going to conclude this. I really want to thank uh, each of you for joining. Uh, I, I, boy, we could have gone on for the rest of the day as far as I'm concerned. Um, I wish I knew each of you, um, you know, some, someday I hope we get to meet in person. Um, I wish all of you the best. Um, uh, Obviously, you will get information uh, from the rest of the program for you prospective students on uh, for the things that you can contact. For the alumni and for those of you interested, you can also go to www.pgiaa, which is the Alumni Association. Again, it's www.pgiaa.org. 
and you can see more of the life experiences and what, what our alumni are doing in the world. Um, so I, I again want to thank you. Um, best of luck, uh, prospective students, on your decisions in your life, whichever way you go. Uh, we support you uh, in whatever path you take. Thank you again so much.